reading. Bond lifts the Day of the Dead celebration setting from about a half dozen movies that came before it, if not more, but still creepy. During this four minute opening one take, almost nothing special happens. All of it is Bond going up to a hotel room with a hot chick and walking out onto the rooftop to set up an assassination. Really, this scene just ends up making you look at your iPhone to check the time and go to the IMDb to find out you have two hours and 15 minutes left. Some basic gunfire and a minor explosion cause this entire building to come down. Somewhere in this fictional universe, a Mexico City citizen is making his own version of the loose change video. Somehow this building smashes into the other one and creates a huge earthquake-like hole on the roof, carving out a slab for Bond to hold onto, but also continues to destroy everything past the slab. Also, Bond still has options for climbing back onto the roof and walking back to the hotel room, but he decides to slide down to the much more dangerous lower floors where the roof just caved in and his death is way more certain. Couch. This guy is still alive. Do you want to get dizzy? Because this part of the movie wants you to get dizzy. Bond immediately puts half of Mexico City in danger because he just needs to kill this guy. The number of times this helicopter should have crashed is too damn high! Some part of the crowd is freaked out about this helicopter, but a large portion of the crowd is still like, Yay! Celebration! This helicopter should have long lost control because helicopters, but Bond gets it back to flying normally because Bond. The bad guys in this movie are so excited about being in their super secret evil organization, they proudly wear rings in public. Also, I thought the whole reason an octopus was called an octopus was because they have eight legs. This ring has seven, so I guess Spectre is symbolically saying, we have tentacles everywhere except for that eighth spot. Just being honest. Drug overdose spoiler recap credits. Jesus guys, four f***ing writers? How much of a nightmare was this movie to put together? I'm standing you down from all operations indefinitely. Which in spy movie speak means you're about to have the craziest mission of your life. Holy sh**, Moriarty, Voldemort, and Bond. Three of the biggest British villains of all time in the same room. Whatever I'm thinking beats this movie's fan fiction for sure. Hey James, when I die I need you to do some super secret spy sh** that MI6 doesn't know about and you could get fired over. And that I couldn't just simply tell you about before I die. I heard a name in Mexico, the Pale King. Oh, you mean Michael Jackson? When the fire started burning this photograph, it knew exactly which person to delete from the picture because fire loves mysteries. Also, mysterious heretofore unmentioned family mystery is mysterious and plot propelling. Smart blood. Microchips in your bloodstream. The signals they transmit while in your blood cause 10 forms of cancer, but good thing we can track you at any cost. It's a shame, really. She was meant for you. But... Q car teases 007 for basically no good reason, other than so that Bond knows it's here and can steal it later. I also have a mortgage and two cats to feed. Well, then I suggest you trust me. The sake of the cats. Did Bond just threaten Q's cats? And maybe Q's life in the process? That's the reason Q is going along with this? My hero? Bond drove the awesome car from London to Rome, which takes a day if you're driving non-stop. Which we know he didn't because he probably stopped to shag a waitress somewhere in the middle of that. So therefore his 48 hours should already be about up. Life insurance. A little late for that. Selling life insurance to a brand new widow at her husband's actual funeral. For no good reason, the killers decide to wait until Lucia is outside before trying to kill her. I guess we could call this Bond Ex Machina, but it's really just goddamn stupid. This woman has a Bella from Twilight level obsession with lamps. I seriously would like to see what would happen if the woman Bond needed to get close to was actually a cave troll. Would he seduce her? I'm also still wondering what kind of magic Bond has to make unwilling women want to have sex with him. But I think in our hearts, we know what the hell it is. Standing mirror sex. Scusa. Once again, super secret organization doesn't require basic identity protocols, like knowing what a member's face looks like. They don't even remember that one of their guys was killed in Mexico City and that any asshole could have a ring. Fuck off. Even though this place is very well lit, Blofeld walks in and is cast in shadow because the reveal is going to somehow make you cream your jeans. He's somehow able to whisper something to this standing guy that no one else can hear, including the microphone directly in front of him. Discount Nikolai Koster Waldu gets a discount Game of Thrones death. This guy spends several seconds gouging out his opponent's eyeballs before just neck twisting him to death. You know, to show how extra cruel he is, I guess. Welcome, James. I guess he found a way to get a peek at Bond on the balcony without James seeing it. I don't have any problem with Blofeld knowing Bond is here, but the guy hasn't moved his head once since he walked in. That is some amazing peripheral vision. These assholes are shooting at Bond when everything about this movie tells me their boss does not want Bond dead right now. By the way, Bond got insanely great parking after showing up so late. Maybe Q gave this car bulletproof tires. The point is that we can never know if the bad guys don't even try to shoot the goddamn tires. The fast and the spectrious Romeo Drift. Oh, you've gotta be kidding me. And Q's gadget car doesn't even work. Wonderful. How badly do we miss John Cleese at this point? The movie is telling me that his car can completely rip off the top of another car and keep driving with no problem. This Aston Martin must have rig-like power to be able to speed up another car like this. This scene almost makes me wish we could see that stupid invisible car again. It looks like you've had dealings with him before. The Craig Bond simply cannot forget Casino Royale. Ever. All during this car chase, no cops. I guess they're all busy investigating the Italian job. Both these super low riding sports cars take a bunch of stairs, no problem. I say again, the Nine Eyes Committee would have full access. Nine Eyes is exactly like God's Eye in Furious 7. And now I'm beginning to believe all 2015 movies were created by some sort of automatic screenwriting software. Ladies and gentlemen, please cast your vote. In a manner in which anyone behind you can see your vote. 
All Money Penny told Bond was that there was an unconfirmed sighting of Mr. White four months ago in a small town in Austria. And with just that information, Bond knew to get on a boat to find this middle of the nowhere house that just happens to be the right one. Ladies and gentlemen, Paranormal Bondivity 5. This guy leaves his window open during the cold, probably just so we can get this jump scare of birds flying through the house. Guy from like two or three movies ago is suddenly important. I'm no Bobby Fischer, but I'm pretty sure this is the White Queen right next to the Black King here. So if this is an active board, why is it still going? And if this is an old, already played board, why is the losing king still standing, as opposed to lying on his side in defeat? Mostly my point is that this chessboard is some Also, chessboard symbolizes a game that has already been played between these two characters, and the dust represents my level of interest in reading into symbolic chessboards. Right now, Bond is thinking, A, it's gonna look like I did that thanks to the use of my gun. B, well, now I'm out one bullet. Hope I don't need that later. And C, this chess game right in front of me is total bull Closing the eyelids of a recently deceased person cliche. Running around out there with his license to kill. Cheeky reference to previous Bond film is not appreciated at this point in a two and a half hour film. Movie has the audacity to tell me that Bond didn't erase the fucking surveillance footage before he left. By the way, how did six time world champion Batista know to show up here? The only reason Bond knew to be here was because of some bullshit he heard about the Pale King, which miraculously led him here. You're going to tell me this guy knows how to interpret that kind of information too? And don't give me any shit about the smart blood, because if they were following that, he wouldn't even need this camera footage. This is where Spectre suddenly turns into Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, where the comic relief sidekick shows up in Austria to find the rogue agent in question. While we're at it, the actress Leia Sedu was in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, and I'm convinced everything is the same movie now. You have a lead. I have a name, an American. <sighs> Well, that narrows it down. Q would be excellent at cinema suits. A whole bunch of bad guys show up to Madeline's office without Bond even noticing their arrival. And how did they get inside this office anyway? Did she let them in? Doubtful. There's a bad guy tailing Q, and I simply don't understand why. They didn't know he would be here, or even who he is. All the bad guys were going after Madeline, but they kept this dude behind to track anyone who might end up boarding a gondola, even if that person wasn't Bond? DNA analysis of the ring should also show Bond, but maybe Bond never leaves DNA anywhere. As Bond's incredibly stupid stunt is about to prove, this easily could have killed Madeline, but f*** it. This bullshit is the most Pierce Brosnan-esque the Daniel Craig Bond movies have ever gotten. This is the kind of lucky bullshit that I can't f***ing stand in these movies anymore. Did it cross your mind that you led them to me? Madeline is 100% f***ing correct. Batista is a horror movie villain. It seems they were all part of one organization. Le Chief, Quantum, Sciara, your friend Mr. Silver. Movie makes half-assed attempt to link all previous Daniel Craig Bond movies together. This organization, do you know what it's called? No. Spectre. Roll credits. Also, do you mean the Syndicate? Actually, you probably mean Spectre. God, man, 2015 movies were confusing. And Bond, you have to find L'American. Why does Key remind Bond of that when that is the whole reason Bond is out here? And now I'm going to bed. But it's still light outside. James Bond awakes in the middle of the night to a mouse on the hotel room floor, and his first response is to reach for his weapon. I mean, what? You're gonna shoot a mouse as opposed to just watching it or calling the front desk? A f***ing mouse, probably on rental from Cinderella, shows Bond where the secret room is. When did the drunk passed out Madeline get into her nightgown? God damn it, are we really going back to Bond morning Vesper? That sh was stretched thin two movies ago. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. I'm coming with you, no, you're not, cliche. But I want to understand what happened to my father. Bond allows Madeline to tag along because of this week's sauce. Plus, because she's the female lead and Bond hasn't banged her yet. This isn't over yet. Do you think this money penny actress is like, I'm supposed to fing glare? That's it? I mean, she had more lines last movie, right? I think we'll skip hand to hand combat. And go straight to sex. I mean, an external train establishing shot. Who said sex? I think it was you, dude, not me. He's on his own. Like, I think maybe half the Bond movies, Bond's bosses desert him and leave him on his own. Well, it only took a day, but after Madeline couldn't stand Bond, she now officially wants to f*** him. Also, where did they get these clothes? Did they stop by a store before they left the hotel? Hey, we're going to be on a train. Better look sharp for a couple hours. Also, damn, this movie is super long. I think creatively they could have left out the whole rogue Bond storyline and cut about 15 minutes from this monstrosity. May I get you an aperitif? I'm not sure. It gets me into trouble. It makes me do crazy things. So, yes then? I mean, you were drunk as f*** last night at the La Merican hotel room. One drink here isn't likely going to be much of a problem, is it? Your drinks, sir. God damn, that's the fastest f***ing bartender ever, considering they only ordered less than a minute ago. Man, what would Bond do without these tell-all reflective surfaces that magically show up before the bad guy does? And yet again, bad guy takes all the surprise out of his showing up here and doesn't just calmly shoot Bond in the back of the head and doesn't appear to even have a gun on him. I guess it's because he's Batista, right? That's not even mentioning how they knew he was on this train. But since the movie wants me to think Spectre is more omnipotent than Batman, I'm guessing that's the reason. <laughs> This asshole hasn't just broken Bond's neck yet, which would seem to be easy for him to accomplish. 
Okay, so this scene suggests Oddjob was seriously about to kill Bond, which later scenes will suggest was not the plan. But whatever, I've long since realized this movie cares zero shits about logic and common sense. What do we do now? Definitely not advance the plot, that's for sure. You know what the worst part about this is? He doesn't get to brag to Mr. White about it. This is an actual train stop. He may be holding your hand to help you feel better, but he's thinking about Vesper right now, no question. Hope you're okay with that. Well, Jesus, how better to show us the bad guy's assholery than show us him viciously overwatering his grass out here in the middle of the fucking desert? Your host invites you both to rest, relax, and join him for drinks at four. How are they supposed to rest or relax under these mysterious you-might-die conditions? And who starts drinking at four these days besides the cast of Teen Mom? She's got to be wondering how they know her size, right? That's creepier than anything we've seen on screen in this movie so far. I came here to kill you. I'm wondering, when Bond made plans to come here, did he hope to kill Blofeld in a normal, clandestine spy manner? Or did he know for a fact that Blofeld would take him around for a tour of the facility and hope he'd get the chance somehow? I really don't understand how this visit came together. How he got invited here, what he hoped would happen. I think he's just glad he had sex with Madeline. Vesper Lynn, for example. Enough of the Vesper guilt! It's been going on two movies too long! She was a good lay who betrayed him. Enough! It was all me, James. It's always been me, the author of all your pain. I organized all the previous four movies' events to nearly kill you but leave you alive just to make this fifth movie reveal an extra big whammy. If this shot of a lizard on a window enhanced your enjoyment of this James Bond movie, please raise your hand. For all the genius these bad guys possess, they have never found a way to make restraints that prevent spies from breaking out of them. More importantly, this guy's plan, spanning the last four movies and this one, culminates in strapping James Bond to a high-tech computer chair to see inside his mind the f***. But did you know that it was my father who helped him through this difficult time? I think when I heard this, I nearly choked on my third box of Raisinets, because Bond officially steals a plot point from Austin Powers' gold member, where we find out Austin and Dr. Evil are brothers. Art imitates art imitates the art that was parodying it. The man inside your head is Ernst Stoffel Blofeld. How dramatic! Does Bond even know what that name means? It means a lot to Bond fans, I guess, but it's peculiar as to why Blofeld felt this needed to be a dramatic moment. None of the guards notice Madeline reaching down where the restraints are, and Blofeld is apparently enthralled with and distracted by his computer for some reason. By the way, it makes almost no sense this watch explodes. Remember when Q gave him this? This was before Bond threatened Q's cats, and he was expected to stay in London with no mission to go on. So why give him a watch that explodes? Tons of gunmen behind, and later in front of Bond, and none of them can hit As per usual, the bad guy's facility has a load of gas tanks that have one-shot explosion capabilities. It's not over yet. Movie delights in giving me horrible news about this movie's runtime. Don't tell me it's London. Don't tell me it's... God damn it. You're saying goodbye. Yes. I think I figured out this two and a half hour movie's biggest problem. It's two and a half hours long! Even though I know the bad guys have this amazing tracking technology, I still wish I could see it in action, so it would explain how they're able to time out a crash like this. Look, if hooding and capturing James Bond was your goal, couldn't you have done that back when he was strapped to the medical chair? Or at least done it better? The bad guys go back to look for M, and here's some ridiculous bull that just makes me angry. First off, M needed to crawl over to the driver's side to get out, because his door was too close to the wall to open, so he clearly had no time to do this without getting caught. Their backs were turned for only a few seconds, and they would have had to run down this long-ass tunnel to escape. Second off, why wasn't anyone standing by the car to make sure this didn't happen? Happen? Why did they need two guys just to open the back of the truck? I'm adding five cents more for this because I'm totally certain of how much bullshit it is. Move! Move! Once again, bad guys are so horrible that Bond is amazing by default. Bond knows now this is a trap, but still continues following the arrows, because he's hopelessly cocky or hopelessly curious, but not smart. <laughs> this is maybe the worst use of a villain's endgame planning time ever. He went out and had all these printed and installed them here at MI6's facility? When? And how? And more importantly, why? Die trying to save her, or save yourself and live with the pain. Okay, first of all, this is a ripoff of many movies where the villain makes the hero choose between saving a loved one and something else. Dark Knight, Spider-Man, Batman Forever, etc. You're bluffing. Why would he be bluffing? And he's going to leave the scene entirely with no way to ensure his target actually dies? God, this movie has completely burned through the last movie's built-up goodwill. I love how Blofeld and his chopper somehow knew exactly where Bond would be when he gave up his search for Madeline and admitted defeat, so that they could be there to shine a light on him in humiliation. Hey, good thing Madeline finally decided to make some noise at the very moment the hope was gone. Also, Bond opens the door and Madeline is sitting there with a gag in her mouth. She isn't struggling to get out, and how the f*** she scream so loudly? The noise must have been from the ghost of MI6. I'm surprised it wasn't a couch. Goodbye, James Bond. And there's the origin story of Blofeld being absolutely certain Bond is dead without knowing for sure. When Blofeld said goodbye, James Bond, he was already flying away from the MI6 building, and it took a long time for Bond to start chasing him down in a speedboat. How the hell is he not out of London by now? Blofeld survives this. 
Bond, who knows there are future sequels in the balance, decides not to assassinate Blofeld and instead arrest him, as though Bond is a morally driven hero or something. Two and a half hour movie teases us with a cut to black like it's all over, but it's not over. Movie went through a lot of trouble to make Madeline 007's girlfriend, but she won't be back in the next one, unless it's to kill her and give Bond a second woman to grieve over for four movies. Did it cross your mind that you led them to me? You were just a girl when I saw you first. Au revoir! Shushada! Why is there a man in that torpedo? There are men and women in all those torpedoes, Captain. I put them there. Who the hell are you? A remnant of a time long past. And now, and now folks, folks, it's time for who do you trust? Hubba, hubba, hubba. Money, money, money. Who do you trust? Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. I heard a name in Mexico, the Pale King. I'll tell you about the Yellow King. But you have to make me believe I am her. 